Well, good morning, church. Hey, I'm so glad to be with you guys today. I just, I'm really touched and encouraged because worship had an all-time high. There, there, amen, yes. There was an anointing there. The presence of the Holy Spirit was tangible. Pastor John had a word from the Lord, and, and he didn't know this because I didn't share my sermon notes or anything like that. So as, the, as a preacher today, I'm listening and I'm hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying, and, and I, it was exactly in line with where we're getting ready to go in our service. So, amen, when we begin to seek the God together, when we're seeking him in worship, when we're seeking him in prayer, when we're seeking him in our connect groups and studies, and when we come together, God speaks to his people. Amen? And so I'm excited, and, and I know I don't have to do this, but I believe in a culture of honor. So I want to thank Pastor John for allowing me to come back to Morningstar, allowing Jennifer and I to come back to Morningstar. This is the first time we're preaching at this campus since it's coming back, and, and it is a great honor to do that with him. And, and I'm just encouraged. You have an amazing lead pastor here. Amen? Amen. The anointing flows top down. I'm going to say that again, because I know that's like an old churchy thing. The anointing of the Holy Spirit for signs, wonders, and miracles to be released, it flows from the head of the church, that's Jesus Christ, down to the senior pastor, to everybody else. When we create a culture of honor and expectation, God shows up in the supernatural. Amen? Amen. Amen. So as a quick background, if you're new with us today, we are in the book of Acts, and I wanted to just give us a quick recap because last week we had Mother's Day. We took a break from that, and I think it's important to help us come back in and understand what we're talking about, what we're looking at, why, why we're even studying this. So the book of Acts had an author, and early historians attribute that to Luke, who was a companion of Paul, and he was a doctor. I love the book of Acts because it's full of details. As a type A personality, I like to know it. I like to hear it. I like to study it. Just give it to me plainly. And that was what Luke was all about. The book of Acts is actually covers a span of 30 years of church history. That's a lot. You know, sometimes when we read the book of Acts and we see 3,000 people were added to a church and a miracle took place here and then a miracle took place here and God healed a person here, we think, wow, that's happening really quickly. And it is, but it's important to remember that we're studying a span of 30 years that the Holy Spirit begins to move in his church. Morning Star, how long have you been here, Pastor John? 19 years, amen, amen. There's a lot of church history here. You think about when Pastor John first came and Pastor Teresa first came to Morningstar. It started off just a little building that needed to be totally flipped and, and redone. And God began to move in that building, and that led to the Build Life program here, Build for Life. And all of a sudden, the sanctuary began to grow, and you're sitting in the blessings of that. And then over the span, God began to move on their hearts to plant another campus in Pennsylvania. That's just 19 years of church ministry in this community. God has so much more in store. Amen? As we keep going, who was the book written to? Luke, Luke wrote the book to a Roman official named Theophilus. So it, today, it would be like somebody recording history of what God did at Morningstar and sending it to our senator or sending it to our governor or sending it to somebody in position of power. Luke was detailed in charge to record the history of Scripture and make sure it was preserved. So why did he write it? Number one, we already said, to present history. It covers the founding of the church, the spread of the gospel, and the movement of the apostles. Number two, Luke wrote the book of Acts to give a defense. The gospel can stand on its own. Amen. The gospel can stand on its own. It doesn't matter what culture that the gospel is presented in. It doesn't matter the situation going on in the government. It doesn't matter the challenges may, that may be faced in the day. The gospel is strong enough to stand on its own and not just stand, but transform the culture. Luke wrote the book of Acts to provide a guide 
Honestly, he, he didn't know how long the church was going to exist here on this earth. And it wasn't a bad thing, but the early church truly believed, listen, Jesus is coming back at any time. I don't know if it's in my lifetime. I don't know if it's going to be the next generation. But Jesus said he's coming back. And as long as we're a church is here on this earth, they need to know what Jesus did what Jesus stood for, the miracles that he released, the kingdom of heaven that was preached, the fact that he came from heaven as a man and fully God, surrendered his life. Nobody could take Jesus' life, but he laid it down for you and I so we would be restored to the Father. Many people use this argument today as why the Bible can't be trusted. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus died on the cross. He's, he's not really coming back. Where has, where's your Jesus? And skeptics challenge this, and, 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 and apologetics have to argue with this, but Peter addresses this issue in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. Peter says this, But do not forget this, church. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow to keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. But he is patient with you, wanting and not anybody to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. A day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. When Peter is unwrapping that for the church, we're sitting here 2,000 years later. It's only been two days. God is patient because he doesn't want a single person to perish. Everyone come to repentance. Luke wrote this book lastly to depict the triumph of Christianity. Despite every roadblock, that the early church faced, the persecution, the gospel was able to spread, not just from Jerusalem, but all of the Roman Empire, and eventually the gospel spread across the entire world. You cannot stop the message of Jesus. Amen? Why was the book important? The book of Acts provides a bridge in the New Testament writing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John cover the teachings of Jesus. But Acts is all about teaching how Jesus transferred his mission to you and I. That the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' day did not end at Calvary. The gospel did not die on a cross. But brave men and women endured challenging times so you and I could be here today. I want to declare this to you today, church, that the gospel is free. Salvation is for all. God made healing available to you. Nobody can stop the work of the Holy Spirit. I do not have the power to heal anybody. I can't save anybody in my preaching. I can't baptize somebody with the gift of the Holy Spirit and see the evidence of speaking in tongues. But I want to encourage you, church, Jesus can. Jesus can. Jesus is faithful to his word where his word will be preached. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The kingdom of God is available to anyone who will call on the name of the Lord. Amen. I'm not here to try to hype up preaching and stir your emotions, but what I want to do today is encourage you that Jesus is alive, he's active, and God wants to stir the church's faith to believe him once again. It's not enough to just come to church and preach a dead message we need the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, not just in our churches, but in our marriages, in our communities, in our school systems, in our workplaces. And as we get into our text today, I'm going to show you how God used ordinary people in their everyday life. And miracles, signs, wonders began to flow, and people came to Jesus because of it. Church, I want to stir your expectation. Holy Spirit, we thank you. You are welcome here. Lord, I pray that you would flood this place. Fill every heart. Baptize everybody with your presence. 
We pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to move again, not just in America, but here at Morningstar, here in our communities, in our workplaces, in our school systems. Jesus, people need an encounter with you. We don't need another fancy argument. We don't need to argue with people till we're blue in the face. God, signs and wonders need to be released in this earth. The early church prayed, Lord, confirm your message with signs and wonders. And Lord, we stand in the gap today that you would do the same. There are many people hurting in our church and outside of our body. God, we need the move of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So a quick short recap, so we're caught up. Chapter one, Jesus commands us to wait for the Holy Spirit. Chapter two, the Holy Spirit shows up in the church. The church is birthed. The first sermon is preached. 3,000 people believe in Jesus, and that's where the church is formed. Chapter three is where we pick up today. God begins working miracles through the apostles. So if you have your Bibles or, or apps or you want to turn onto the screen, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. This is not our primary pe- preaching passage, but I have to go into this so I can explain where we're going for our sermon today. So bear with me. So Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, I'm reading for the NLT translation. It says this, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. Do you know church had a prayer service? They went to pray. The apostles went to seek the face of God. There wasn't an agenda. There wasn't the preaching. It was nothing but, Lord, we're going to meet with you. And it says, as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried there. And it says, each day he was put besides the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate. So he could beg from people going into the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And Peter and John looked at him intently. I love that. They looked at him intently. There was compassion. And Peter said, Look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting to receive some money. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And it says that Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. I mean, how many of you know you got to have some faith? This man was crippled from birth. He never walked. He was dependent on others for help. He begged outside the temple and said, man, you guys are the religious folks. Hopefully you'll help me. And Peter, I, I, I know I like Peter. He puts his foot in his mouth, and I do that very often. <laughs> and Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, says, I don't got money. I don't got gifts. I can't change your financial situation, but what I do have, I have the power and I have the presence of God and I've been with Jesus and it's not by my might, but it's by the mighty name of Jesus and he pulled this man. He pulled this man. I I mean, in our natural, I'm thinking, man, if I try to pick a crippled man up, he's gonna fall down. I'm gonna embarrass him. Peter didn't worry about that. For miracles to be released, you have to be willing to look foolish. For signs and wonders to be released in the church, you have to be willing to look stupid and lay down your pride and go against the cultural norms. I mean, I can imagine the the crippled man, wait a minute, wait a minute, What what are you doing? Why are you trying to pull me up? But Peter got down on his level. It says he grabbed him and pulled him up. Watch what this says. It wasn't a special moment. The lights didn't go off. It wasn't a blink. But the Bible says this, and as he did it, as he stepped out in faith, as he was willing to look foolish and stupid, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed. This gets so much cooler. I saw it this morning as I was studying right before the message. They were instantly healed and strengthened. God did not just heal the man of his brokenness and what struggled him and what bound him, but God restored the years that were lost and brought supernatural strength. God healed him and strengthened him because Peter was willing to lay down his pride 
and step out in faith. How much does God want to do for his church and through his church if the church would just lay down their pride and stop trying to look cool? The Bible says that the man jumped and stood on his feet and he began to walk. Then walking and leaping and praising God, the crippled man went into the temple with them. This is important because in the old Jewish law, if you were hurt, crippled, deformed, whatever it may be, they looked at that as a sign from God that you were full of sin and wickedness. And in Jewish thought, the temple was reserved just for the holy of holies, the presence of God, where we go to meet with God himself. So if you had these issues, your life was full of sin, you were not allowed to go to God. The man all his life never met with Jesus. But in one moment, he entered that temple. He defied all cultural, religious laws and expectations, and he entered the temple praising God. All the people saw him walking and heard him. And when they realized this had been the lame beggar that they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. And although we could park here and and, and talk about all this, I I told you this is not our primary teaching text, but I do want to give you four things real quickly that we can learn from this. Number one, if we want to see miracles released in our lives, we have to be willing to take our eyes off our situation. Peter and John looked at the crippled man and they said, look at us. Stop looking at what you're going through, look at us. And many of us today, if we are willing to look up to Jesus and stop looking at the trials we're going through, there are giants in the land, but if we will look to God who promises to be with us, to walk through us, the Bible says that he made you as an overcomer. God will move in your life. You see, when the crippled man took his gaze off his situation, he began to expect something different. So four things we can learn from the passage. Number one, if we want to see miracles, signs, and wonders move through our life, we have to take our eyes off our situation. Number two, what we can learn real quickly is Jesus is willing to get down in our mess. In the book of Daniel, Jesus, it says an angel, but I believe it was Jesus, stepped down for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they took a bold stance before a king and said, hey, we will worship God even if it costs our life. Jesus was in the midst of a fiery furnace. Jesus stepped down from his throne in heaven as a man to lay himself down for you and I. Jesus was willing to step down and reach out to you and me through others. Jesus is willing to get in the middle of our mess because he promises us we will never walk alone. Church, am I preaching or are we sleeping? All right, it's first service. Maybe you didn't get your coffee. Number three, when Jesus touches your life, you will never be the same again. The man was healed. He was strengthened. He was praising God. He was worshiping the Lord. He went into the temple that he was never allowed to go into. The Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did for us, and the word of our testimony, what Jesus continues to do in his church. This is what Jesus did and still continues to do. When God shows up in your life, you can expect to never be the same again. That addiction you're going through, that marriage struggle you're going through, those relationships, that work situation, whatever it may be, if you would get a hold of Jesus. Come on, you need to hear this. Like the woman with the bleeding issue, she was willing to press through and get a hold of Jesus. When you touch Jesus... When you get to the heart of Jesus, you're never the same again. I think today's church struggles with that. They think the the idea, well, God is sovereign. I, I believe in that. God is totally in control. So if I pray about something and God doesn't answer it, that's the end of it. No, Jesus invites us to ask, seek, knock. The door will be open. Pursue Jesus. Number four, what we can learn from this text, God wants to use you. I love this because it said that the crippled man sat in front of the beautiful gate. 
And in the NLT translation, beautiful and gate is capitalized. And that caught my attention. In John 10, Jesus says that I am the gate that the sheep enter for eternal life. There are people that you are, know who are sitting in front of Jesus because you're around them. And they need your help to enter his kingdom. God wants to use you. Think of your family members, your coworkers, your loved ones. If you'd be willing to take your eyes off your own situation, if you were willing to get down in their mess, just like Jesus does, if you're willing to get a hold of Jesus in your prayer life, imagine what God would do through you. I pause because I want you to think about that. Imagine the people God would touch through you. That was my introduction. You're like, oh no. (laughs) Since I got 24 minutes, we're good. I'm making great time. (laughs) Today's sermon's actually coming from Acts chapter three, verses 17 through 21. So it'll be on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. The scripture says, now fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying this, that his Messiah would suffer. Verse 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Verse 21, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he'd promised long ago through his holy prophets. Church, the big idea for today is this. God wants to refresh me and restore me. And if I, I'm preaching to myself as well, if I want to experience that all God has for me, it first starts with repentance. Amen? So what is repentance? The Old Testament uses the word shuv, which means to turn or return to God. In the New Testament, the Greek word is metanoia, which means a changing of mind or heart. Now, if we bridge the two meanings together, the Hebrew definition and the Greek definition, we get repentance is this. You're turning to God, and in the process, God is transforming you. You see, repentance is not a, I'm sorry, A repentance isn't, I've been busted. A repentance isn't an ugly word. Repentance is saying, God, I turn to you. Do what you want with me. Transform me. Change me. Heal me. Whatever your will is, God, I am open to you. So if God wants to refresh me and restore me, it's important to understand that it starts with repentance. So what does the Bible say about repentance? Number one, repentance is for everyone. Repentance is not a one-time thing that helps us get into the kingdom of heaven and, oh, now I got my fire insurance. I'm not going to hell. All is good. No, repentance is for everyone. In Matthew 4, 17, Jesus taught, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals his transgressions, meaning whoever hides their sins, will not prosper, but the one who confesses and forsakes it will obtain mercy. Acts 17, 30 says that the times of ignorance, God overlooked it, but now he commands all people everywhere, repent. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, this is the famous COVID scripture. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn. You see how the Bible is teaching? Come to God in humility. Seek him through prayer. Turn from your wicked ways. God promises, I will hear you from heaven. Do you know sin blocks your communication with the Lord? When we allow a lifestyle of sin without repentance, God literally says, I've turned off your spiritual blessing. Your prayers will not even be heard. But God says, if you are humble, 
If you're willing to lay down your pride, if you're willing to look foolish, if you're willing to say, God, I need you, I love you, I want you, I turn to you, God says, I'll heal your land. God says, I'll answer your prayers. Husbands, the Bible even goes deeper. It says, if you don't treat your wives well, God says, he'll stop listening to your prayers. God cares about marriage. God cares about your family. God cares about how you treat each other. Wives, God has a lot to say there, but it's not Mother's Day anymore, and they didn't let me preach. We might do a marriage class in the fall, so get ready for that one. (laughs) Proverbs 123 says, If you turn at my reproof, behold, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon you and make my words known to you. You want to hear the voice of God? It starts with repentance. You want to hear God speak into your life and speak through the scriptures? It starts with a heart of surrender. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10 says this, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly grief produces death. Acts 19.4, and Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. Revelation 3.19 says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous. Amen. Be zealous for the Lord. Be excited for him. I'm not angry, I'm zealous. I'm passionate about Jesus. I'm passionate about seeing his freedom be released in your life. I'm passionate about healthy marriages and healthy families and healthy children and broken addictions. I'm passionate for the kingdom of God. So be zealous and repent. Scriptures go on and on. There's so much more we could cover. I just wanted to give you a quick overview. Repentance is not a one-time thing, but it's an everyday thing. Repentance is a lifestyle of submitting my thoughts, my emotions, and my actions to God and covering under his covering. Three things the Bible teaches about repentance. Number one, we talked about it is for everyone. Number two, I love this, comes right from our Acts passage. Repentance brings refreshing. In the context, Peter is urging the people to turn from their sins and turn towards God so that they may experience forgiveness and spiritual renewal. The phrase, times of refreshing, I love that because that's an old Christian song and that's been stuck in my heart for the last three weeks. You bring times of refreshing. Times of refreshing. You bring times of refreshing to my soul. It goes on to say that when I'm weary from the fight and I'm trying to do what's right, when when life has dragged me down and I'm exhausted and I'm trying to live right before you, you bring times of refreshing to my soul. Psalm 68, 9 reads this. It says, you, O God, sent plentiful rain where you confirmed your inheritance. When it was weary, your people found a dwelling in it. Your goodness, O God, provided for the needy. I want you to catch this. The psalmist used rain as a metaphor to describe how when we come under the covering of God, God meets the needs of his people. There is blessing with obedience. I can't tell if the church is hearing it, resisting it, excited for it, or ready to go. But I want to encourage you. There is a blessing when we come under the covering of Jesus, when we're obedient to his word. God opens the floodgates of heaven. These are not just beautiful songs we sing, but they're scriptural truth. When I say, God, I surrender to you. I come to you. I repent. I honor your word above my thoughts. God says, I hear you. Your prayers would be answered. I'm going to flood you you with blessing, protection, love, whatever you have need of. God promises times of refreshing. Psalms 91, 4 through 7 says that he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. I love this. This is where Pastor John's word connects. It says that his faithfulness 
God's faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. The very character of God will be what defends you and fights for you when you've surrendered to him. It says that the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys midday, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. It will not come near you. God will protect you with his very character. Amen? He's to be trusted. God will not let his character be tarnished. He is God. And he said, my character will fight to defend you and fight what comes at you. He's faithful. Matthew 6, Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in all these things that you worry about. Where you'll eat, what you'll wear, where you'll live. God says, if you will seek my kingdom, I'll provide for you. When God's people repent, Jesus takes care of their needs. What does the Bible teach about repentance? Number one, it's for everybody. Number two, repentance brings refreshing. And number three, repentance brings restoration. You see, the word restore in this passage refers to the idea of being renewed, repaired, and brought back to a previous state. God was always looking to get his creation back to the garden. God made you and I to have a perfect relationship with each other and with the Lord. Sin came in and broke that perfect relationship. It broke that mirror where we reflect Christ. But God is looking to renew, repair, and bring back his church to a previous state. Peter explains that Jesus is the one who can bring about restoration in our lives. That it's through his death and resurrection, Jesus offers forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life. Those who believe in him are given the opportunity to be restored right with God and experience a newness of life. The restoration Peter speaks about is not just physical or material, but it's a spiritual one. It involves coming back to the Lord by his grace and by his love. There's nothing you can do. Repentance is only available if the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart. There's nothing I can do to earn God's love. There's nothing I can do to earn God's grace. There's nothing I can do to earn God's favor, but come under his word. Overall, the concept of restoration in this passage emphasizes the power and the promise of God to heal and renew our lives through faith in Jesus Christ. I love this. Jesus declared in his earthly ministry that he came back to break the works of Satan, the bondage of sickness, the bondage of disease. Whatever was Satan working out in your life, he came to destroy it. And one of the ways we continue to partner with the ministry of Jesus is we don't allow strongholds to be built in our lives. The easiest way to give a foothold to the enemy is to live in sin, is to live in guilt, is to live in hatred, is to live in unrepentance. And the best way you can demolish a stronghold of the enemy in your life is saying, God, I repent. I turn to you, release the floodgates of heaven, destroy that barrier that's been set up in my life, in my heart, in my mind. Set me free in Jesus' name. Amen. Repentance destroys strongholds. I, I have an object lesson for you today, and, and I love that because, you know, some people are auditory. I'm not auditory. I'm visual, so I needed a visual. But I, I want you to see this. We have a fence. An offense serves two purposes. Number one, it serves to set a boundary. This is the line. Don't cross it, right? If you guys have a house or, or you rent or you have kids or dog, you guys know you offense protects what you have. Don't cross it. It keeps the good in and it keeps the bad out. When we stay in the boundaries of Scripture and what God promises to us, just in the few, in the many verses, actually, that we read this morning, God has promised to protect you, to provide for you, to give you rest, to restore relationships, to build a community around you. I don't have this in the notes, so you won't have it on the screen, but I love this, Psalms 23. I just want to read this to you. 
as you are picturing this. David said this, that the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. That's not funny. Stop sending me text messages while we're preaching. <laughs> it says that he, he lets me rest in green meadows besides peaceful streams. It says that he renews my strength, that he guides me along the right path. He brings honor to his name, that even though I walk in the darkest valleys, I will not be afraid for you're close beside me. It says that your rod and your staff, you're protecting me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You can bring joy in the midst of my problems. It says you honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. And surely, church, I want you to hear this. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness, your unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of my Lord forever. Amen? God has promised us so much if we would come under his word, but I want to caution you what happens when we step out of the boundary of the gospel and his word, when we step away from what God has called us to do and what God has called us to live, when we step away from the boundaries he created, it exposes us to the curse of sin. When we step out of the boundary, it exposes us to Satan and demons. We're no longer protected. When we step out and live in the boundaries of sin, it exposes us to who we really are. And when ultimately, when we step out of the protection and the love and the grace that God has for us, it exposes us to the very wrath of God himself. God has given us so many promises if we would live according to his word. Repentance is just saying, hey, I've stepped out of the boundary. I'm turning back, and I'm walking in. Amen. How many of you need to feel some peace in your life today? You need some rest. You need some provision. You need relationships restored. Maybe you're lonely, and you need a community. It all starts with repentance. Worship team, you can get ready to come on up. We're going to get ready to land this plane. But there are really, there's five barriers that keep you from repenting. I'm not going to take long. I still have 10 minutes, so I'm good. Five barriers to repentance. Number one, pride. Well, I don't, I don't need to repent. I'm good. I, I, everything's all right. I like this. Pride will keep us from experiencing the grace and the love of God. Pride was the very sin that caused Satan to fall from heaven and started the conflict that we have today. Number two, five barriers to keep us from repentance is pride. Number two, attachment to your sin. God, I'm living outside of your boundary, but I like it. It feels good. I like the high. I like that relationship. I, I know, God, you've told me not to have sex before marriage, but I'm enjoying it right now, and it feels good, and I don't actually feel any consequence. God, I like this. Attachment to sin will literally stop you from experiencing the presence of God, but the Bible is very clear. It blocks your very prayers. God will stop hearing your prayers. Men, I want to challenge you. It's hard to be a man and follow Jesus. It's hard to be anybody and follow Jesus. But men, I want to challenge you in your relationships, in your marriages, in your community. Set the example. I do not want my prayers blocked in my marriage. I need the Holy Spirit. I need Jesus. There are battles that are happening behind the scenes, and I need God to move in them. Go. I don't even know everything that's happening, but Jesus is aware, and I cannot afford for my prayers to be ineffective. Jesus said that, that my house will be called a house of prayer. But in order for us to be a house of prayer, we need to be a house that is spiritually clean and renewed and committed to Jesus. Five barriers that stop repentance. Pride, attachment of sin. Number three, fear of judgment or punishment. Satan will try to use fear to stop you from confessing and going to the Lord or going to each other and saying, you know what, it's just going to make things worse. 
I'm going to tell you, sometimes it does make things worse, but Jesus promises too many benefits to ignore that. Number four, lack of understanding. Maybe you don't know you're fully sinning or the gravity of your sin and how it's impacting other people. And number five, you don't actually believe in God. Sin was big enough for Jesus to give up his throne and give up his life to come down for you and I. I'm not talking about a small thing. You can start to play softly when you're ready. Church, we're not talking about a small thing. The sin that you're so eager to hide and cover up. You know, John says that if we say we have no sin, we've already lied. Each and every one of us are dealing with something. I'm a pastor here at this church. I deal with things. My farts smell just like your farts smell. (laughs) I still have a kid's ministry brain. Every single one of us are struggling to be more like Jesus. The difference between the struggle and the victory is being willing to be honest and say, God, I'm still a sinner. Yeah, I'm saved by grace. I live by faith. But I think today's church has got caught up in a spiritual high of saying, Jesus saved me and I'm better than you. God is calling his church to come back and repent. I opened up with our big idea today and it says, God wants to refresh me and restore me. God wants to give so much to me. And if I want to experience that all God has for me as your pastor, as a pastor, I'm preaching to myself. It starts with repentance. So our action step is very simple today. I'm going to ask the question, what do you need to bring to Jesus? What thoughts, what feelings, what actions, what are you wrestling with that you, maybe you know it's been a struggle, but you've never actually turned to the Lord and said, God, I surrender this to you. Help me in this area. I need you. Today, I want to provide you an opportunity. We're not going to have a, uh, an altar call where it's a, a hype worship. We want to create an atmosphere for you to meet with Jesus. That could look like you coming to the altar, kneeling and praying before the Lord. I think there's value in that. That could look like you in your chair. Maybe you turn around, kneel, and you're in your chair and you're praying. You don't necessarily want somebody else to pray for you. We're going to create an atmosphere of prayer. Because I believe God wants to do so much more than what we're experiencing now. But it starts with an attitude of repentance. Amen? Don't let pride separate you from all that God has for you. I want to encourage you, church, repent and be transformed by God. Choose today who you are going to serve. Are you going to come under God's blessing and live in the grace of our Lord? Or are you going to let sin separate you and separate your prayers and separate the overflow that David talked about and said, you know what? I just love this habit. I just love this thought. I just love this action way too much. I want to challenge you, church. Don't open yourself up to Satan and demons. Don't open yourself up to the wrath of God. Come back under his covering. Amen.